So yesterday, I thought I'd finally get around to fixing the stovetop of our old falling apart range. One potentiometer, the little knob you turn to turn on the element, went about a year ago. Another one went about a week ago. And so I'm going to order the parts. So I'm going to fix it myself. So I take it apart the back and I unplug it the first time I did, but I didn't the second time I unplugged it, and I looked for the part and it made a sound and I fried the motherboard. And so anyway, I'm at Trail Appliances in the uh, scratch and dent section, which I love the most because I figured I'd get the most range for my dollar there and just, you know, because it was in a showroom somewhere or somebody scratched it on the side that you're never going to see. So I'm in like... Uh, Saturday morning, Calgary coveting paradise, uh, looking at all of the gear and all of the toys and all of the shiny brushed aluminum in that place. And I made myself set a budget before I went, and Fran lets me go on my own. You pick one. Uh, so no pressure there. So I'm looking at the different stoves, and there's two with no prices. Anthony comes over, can I help you? And he gets me the two prices for those two, and one of them was surprisingly cheaper than my budget by a couple hundred bucks, and one was over my budget by a couple hundred bucks. So the spread was $400 between those two stoves. And so I'm standing there, knowing I gotta preach on coveting and materialism, <laughs> and going, oh, shoot. And Anthony looks at me and he goes, are you okay? And I said, well, I gotta preach a sermon tomorrow on coveting, you know, and you know, the whole idea, what's coveting me? Well, the whole idea that we don't need to always have more and more and want what our neighbors want and maybe we can dial that back a bit. And so then he jumped in with his theology. My mom, I'm not religious, my mom's Jewish, my dad's a Muslim, but I believe if we consumed a little bit less, there'd be a lot left over for the rest of the world. So maybe this is a good sermon. And so we're trying to figure out, I'm trying to figure out, well, how do I choose? And the 10th commandment goes like this. You shall not covet. You shall not want for yourself your neighbor's wife. You shall not desire your neighbor's house or land, his manservant or his maidservant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Years ago, I was terrible in terms of keeping this commandment. A, uh, I coveted, and this is in my first career, I coveted my partner's Porsche Carrera Cabriolet 4 when he got it. Like rails coming off the Queenie on Highway 10. I can still feel that feeling. And the, oh, I want this car. I, want, I have to be him. And then a year later, going to my other partner's cottage on Lake Muskoka in Port Carling, probably a two or two and a half million dollar cottage now, and smoking. <laughs> so beautiful. And he gave it to us for the week. And remember that, Fran? It was great. We left a bag of stinking diapers at the door when we left and forgot to take it with us as our th thank you gift. Uh, I used to covet other people's better jobs than mine or their significantly higher salaries or their aptitudes or their nicer house. At a time was buying a new house every 18 months for three houses in a row is how bad it got. I used to covet people's in-shape bodies. Maybe I still covet. I used to covet people's full head of hair. <laughs> and I do that a lot now. Nowadays, though, not so much that stuff. My uh, cove de jour is uh, a fictional scholar who gets to sit in an ivory tower and write books without any dis interruptions or having to be a pastor of a church and just gets to write and think all day long. And yes, those of you who know what I do at New Hope, uh, I see the irony in that. I get paid to think and write <laughs> and get lots of time to write a book as well. What I want more of, ironically, I already have. And coveting is kind of ugly that way. By turning our focus onto something that we don't yet possess, we lose sight of what we already have. And God says in the Tenth Commandment, don't do that. Don't want all the time what other people have for yourself. 
Don't lust after other people's stuff. And the reason God says that is because he wants to rob you of all the joy, happiness, satisfaction, fun, and life fulfillment that coveting can bring to your life. I mean, surely this is one command that God didn't have to give if we think it through. Always wanting the next thing is not a recipe for contentment or satisfaction. Coveting hurts you. It creates huge discontent and dissatisfaction. And if we let it run loose in us, we become ever incessant and increasing ingrates. And that's no way to live a life. Coveting is fueling consumer debt rates. So in report on business this week, Canadian consumer debt rates are higher than they've ever been. Our consumer debt rates, I think, are indicative of where coveting could prob problematically lead. It creates anxiety in you when you're always looking at the next thing. It undermines your sense of self if you're believing the lie that the next thing is going to finally make you. Make you. All this wanting leaves you wanting. And yet, there is something in you and in me that just keeps going. I mean, pick your coveting sphere. I'm sure we each have our own specialty. Why? I used to blame the advertisers, because of course it has to be the advertisers' fault that I'm constantly wanting more and more and more. You know, pick an article that talks about how many thousands of ads that you see every day telling you that you need this next thing. I mean, so really, it's not your fault. <laughs> you just live in a world and... You always need the next thing, the newest thing, anything. Blame those people on Madison Avenue. And that is a very true reality. And maybe you and I need to learn to turn off some screens or put some kind of blinkers on our life so that we're not always being exposed to this huge tide of you need more, you need more, you need more. A media diet. That may be part of it, but still, there is a part in you that wants more and that desires having that new, better, other, next thing. It, it's almost as though we as human beings are made for something new, better, other, and next. And of course, we are in the Christian understanding of the world. St. Augustine, my heart is restless until it finds its rest in Thee, God. We are meant to find ourselves and full satisfaction and joy and be fully human in finding that ultimate other. God put that desire in you for a very good purpose to yearn for and to search for Him, to want Him, and want Him, and want Him, and want more and more and more and more forever of God. Listen to theologian Leslie Newbigin on this. He wrote, Because man and women, because man is so made that only God can satisfy him, his desires are unlimited. When he tries to satisfy unlimited desires by means of natural goods or materialism, he ruins himself. You and I are made with an unlimited desire for something more. And you couple this huge God put in you homing device with a world that is constantly pushing and dealing their definition of what something more is, I mean, it's hard not, it's hard, uh, how can anyone 
not fall into the breaking of this tenth command and covet. So what do you do? Just kind of close your eyes to the world and go live out in the foothills and cut yourself off from our society and swim against the tide that way? Pray for strength not to want? Seems to me that if those desires are really meant for God, there has to be a way. God has to have a way for you to channel them in more healthy ways toward him. That's what they're meant for. You are meant as a human being to find your ultimate sense of security and home in your relationship with God. So your home is beautiful, it's a gift, but it's not your home. You're meant to find rest in the eternal sense of rest in Him, not in a security that comes from your financial portfolio or RRSP primarily or your retirement dream. You're made to find joy in knowing God first and foremost, before and after and around any joy that you find from a new outfit or a new toy or a new person in your life. The poet songwriter writes, why is everyone hungry for more, 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 they say, more, more. I have God's more than enough more joy in one ordinary day than they get in all of their shopping sprees. At day's end, I'm ready for sound sleep. For you, God, have put my life back together. 